comic stuff mostly. I live on paintings. Um, a lot of ideas and concerns that I have have been put here, so we'll get to it as I come to that. But um, generally, being an artist, I think we were trying to um, address anything. It's not the idea wasn't to be political in uh, the output, but of late, I think things have become sort of political because it's uh, affecting the freedom of the artist or the space, the space that we work in. So it looked like um, there were more things to say than when I started. So I want to go first into a story, which is just a pure idea, dream space. It's part of my book called Aspirus, which asks or tries to ask the question, who put that dream in your head? And we're always enthu about coming and speaking to students because it's the only place where a little bit of hope is left, I feel. Once you get into a comfortable job and you have your regular salary, you are not going to break out of that or you'll find it difficult to break out of that. So if some change is to be expected, I think it comes from the younger lot, from the students. So we just go into the story. There is a, this comes in the middle of the book and it's the only part with text. So we start somewhere in space or an imaginary space from where a creature starts flying in and we come to the dreamer. So once upon a time there was a dreamer. He had a dream one day and uh, he told his friends about it. And they told him it was a great dream. The dreamer loved his dream. So he made a house for the dream. Soon the dream was too big for it. So the dreamer built a small town, but the dream grew bigger. Then the city was built, but it was empty. The dreamer thought hard. How do you sell the city to a bunch of people? Everyone was looking for their dreams, but they didn't really know where or what it was. So he just had to help them. He called it the dream city. And then everyone's like, wow, that's, that's what I was looking for. So let me go in and be part of the city. So he addressed the people of the city. He showed them their dream, which is actually his dream. And they say, you know, because that's the idea of Dream City or the dream of Dream City, it must be the dream that all of us have, right? And they all lived happily in their dream. So the rest of the story is also there. There's, there's as much more to the written part where the dream goes out of control, but I'll leave that for the people who want to read the book. Um, because, yeah, otherwise it'll be like pushing too much. This is the first book that I made called Moonward. I was just putting up stuff online. Um, a lot of things, I, I had an, uh, started working in advertising and uh, then moved to Greenpeace. So advertising time, the question was, who am I doing this work for? Or what am I adding with my skills to this thing? Uh, so I, had, I made a story about like uh, Abubin's dead and he's gone to heaven. And uh, there's a big queue uh, to get to the uh, escalator which leads up. So uh, everyone seems to be going to heaven and everyone's got a lot of baggage. Like everyone's carrying like tons of like things, I don't know what. But Abubin's got one book and that's about it. And then it seems that we were supposed to make soap uh, all our life, you know, but nobody told Abubin about it. Uh, so Abubin didn't carry the soap and everyone else is carrying like tons of soap. So you deposit the soap and you get that kind of a place in heaven. So it, Abubin felt kind of left out and I thought that was like a nice uh, way of me assessing myself in the space. So these kind of stories were going up online. And uh, small publishers from Chennai called Blaft, very nice people, very bad business people. They got in touch and they published this. And this is out of print now, but it came in 2009. And this is in 2012, I made Legends of Halahala because uh, everyone who went through Moonward uh, really thought I was gonna kill myself or something. Uh, very depressed and sad it must be, you know, like such, such traumatic stories. It wasn't, uh, and it's not like that. If you're creating something and if you're spending like two, three years in a book, I don't think it's because of depression or anything. I, I would like to say it's because of hope because we're putting the stories down and we're expecting people to like react to it. There is, there is hope in it, right? Uh, so this had a bunch of funny stories, uh, no words at all. So the publishers called it India's first like silent book or something. Um, so a bunch of stories, no words, very much colorful and showing the lighter side of Hala Hala. Hala Hala is the world that I created. All the work that Abhupan does is set in Hala Hala. It's a nice convenient parallel because I can take a few liberties that don't happen over here and also parallel and 
parody a bunch of things that are happening here in that world. So you will come to that later. You'll see the similarities are running too close now. It's a little getting a little uncomfortable. Um, this is Asperus, the book I was talking about, from where that first part is taken. This is how I see the Hala Hala dimension now. Uh, technically, the planet we're talking about is somewhere here. It's number three. Uh, but I don't think you'll be able to like figure out much more from that. Um, this is a story that ran in uh, Rolling Stone uh, magazine for about nine years. Uh, this is just the central part of it. I'm not going to show you the whole thing, don't worry. Um, so he's the chosen one. You've been chosen now. Uh, you are the beginning of the story. Two wandering musicians were lost in an endless desert. They ran out of food and water. Soon their legs could go no further. Dying of thirst, they decided to pay, uh, play, play their music and welcome the end. But the music made them feel better and they played on into the night. Their songs grew louder and they danced harder. The ground shook and opened up. The music was so loud it woke up the sleeping land. Streams gushed out from the sand dunes. Amazed, they played on and watched the land come alive. By dawn, amidst honey and, and fruits, they were tired and hungry no more. So that reflected in many stories, this part of it, this regeneration, rebirth kind of thing. Uh, so I like that. Now we're doing a parody on cricket because I think cricket is completely pointless. I have a, a, a bad history with cricket. My dad wanted to like make me a cricketer. I'm not that athletic or anything, uh, but I like you know really tried to play. Um, but you know um, I didn't really like like to play. Uh, so we have made a series which is basically a world of cricket. Now that's the world you want, right? So uh, if you don't know how to play cricket or do commentary or do like, you know, make pads or some shit like that, uh, you, you're not going to be uh, able to sustain yourself in Planet Cricket. So cricket's all over that. It starts tomorrow and we're going to run every day with it for like 50, 50 days, I think. It's the time of the IPL thing. Uh, it's a complete party, spoof on cricket. Uh, even if you're a fan of cricket, you can like, uh, check it out. I have a lot of baggage of like, you know, these useless cricketer names from my childhood. So I've used all that and <laughs> punned on it. Um, this is a Bangalore dystopia that I made, so it comes... I'm trying to slowly get you into that world that we're creating. Uh, so here, this is a future setting. It's about 32 years into the future from 2014 when I made it. Uh, I'm sure they, they had a choice at some time. How could they choose this for their children? So basically, it's the future generation looking back and thinking, like, at some point, there must have been a call or a point where they could decide and nobody decided. Uh, or they just decided to go with the flow and make life tougher for everybody else. This becomes a recurring theme again. We have only limited resources. We don't have the resources to really live out all our dreams of like building shops after shops or like buying cars after cars. So when are we going to like, as the, uh, well, we call ourselves the smartest people, a smartest race on the planet, things like that. Uh, when are we going to like take a call on that and see how to slow down a bit, um, look at things and try to make life a little more easier for the next generation? Maybe, you know, we can't earn all that profit and like run away with it anyway. So. This theme keeps recurring. So I came up with this idea called Braindead. Uh, Braindead looks at satire, spoof, uh, poking holes at the mainstream. Uh, the mainstream is getting too loud. It's too tough to like talk anything other than the mainstream. Uh, you can't get into a detailed conversation with most people because there are these topics like Bollywood or cricket or something, and you know you just talk about that, and that's that's the general banter that you want to go for. Uh, so Braindead comes from my love of Mad Magazines and Adbusters. Um, you might be knowing Mad. Uh, if you haven't seen Adbusters, it's pretty quaint, actually. Check it out. It's really nice. And we're nowhere near as smart as these two guys are, but we're trying. Uh, so we do a bunch of things, like Braindead hopes to like, open your brain like that, uh, on your head, and you know, feed you some stuff so you, know, you and your mom are happy. Um, and then, you know, we help uh, large corporations develop your brain. So we take brains and then we develop and we build on top of that. And then large corporations benefit a lot from developing brains. Mm. And then uh, we make, we are totally for like uh, all the commercial efforts out there. So we sell uh, Che Guevara t-shirts and we make people who have no idea who Che Guevara is, like we make them wear it and we make a lot of money. 
Um, then uh, this question keeps coming, especially when I come back to Kerala. My grandfather's a priest, and uh, this God thing is always there. So like, okay, man-made booze, that's a famous like t-shirt thing. Man-made booze, God-made weed. Uh, who do you trust is a thing, but man-made God, so who do you trust, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, then we go to the more dystopian part of uh, Hala Hala and Braindead. So this was launched on Braindead, and uh, I guess you guys can read it. It runs on News Laundry now, uh, thrice a week. So this is one of the earlier ones when we were sort of preempting the situation. I think the ship is much closer now. So, and then, uh, you know, ba ba ba, and like everyone repeating ba ba ba, uh, and yeah, you know. <laughs> so um, this came at the demonetization time. I was trying to like put it in one picture to see like what that looks like. And I felt, you know, you all felt that your money's there, you can't take it out, and you probably give a limp or something and get it. So it worked better with mutton because I was working on a theme with sheep at the time. Sheep had become, um, well, very important in showing what was going on. Uh, license of the Lambs, freedom of speech, uh, dissent. Really? No, 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 I have some more to go. Like, please, hold on. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. Then uh, I figure that the balance is changing, and uh, you know, um, certain. Well, we always depict justice with uh, the balance, and uh, we never show like who's holding the balance really. So you know, what if it was a situation like that? And I think this uh, was done during the time when the four judges protested in the Supreme Court, and I thought that was a very important move. And you can see how the media uh, and the powers that be sort of nicely quieted it down. Uh, they made the judges look somewhat doubtful and uh, as though like, you know, they were these rogue kids like running out before the bell was rung or something like that. I thought that, that was pretty mean. I thought it was an important point. Uh, then we go to a uh, more superhero kind of like a th dystopia. Uh, it comes from the idea that, uh, you know, we were discussing outside also. Um, Thank you. Um, Ambedkar had uh, given this uh, idea out uh, when he was uh, presenting the constitution. He said, uh, we have this problem with bhakti. We have this inbuilt bhakti thing built into us. We want to like worship God or um, a king or a white man or whoever, you know. It's part of our thing. So we got to be careful about this bhakti idea because if you put one person in charge of things, if you put one person or a personality instead of an organization, then it's going to be dicey. So it's very similar to Orwell's dilemma that we talk about. Orwell took pains to like warn the people of a lot of things, and who got the benefit from it, or who read that. So it's Orwell's dilemma is basically Orwell turning around in his grave and thinking, why the hell did I tell these people these things? So it's kind of similar for Ambedkar also, I think. Let's make it easy for Ambedkar. Uh, so I created this uh, superhero called Rashraman, and thank you very much. Um, so. Um, Basically, the idea of superhero, right? So I want to question that. And it goes a lot with what Prakash was saying earlier also. You know, the superstar culture, that kind of thing. And uh, what does it lead to? It leads to the same bhakti thing. And uh, then you have these superheroes coming in your comics, and even in your movies now. And he's wearing like a flag, like Captain America or something. And he's, what he's doing is okaying a lot of history. And he's owned by the largest corporations. And what he's coming out and saying you buy as your thing. Bruce Wayne, everyone like, likes Batman. So Bruce Wayne, what does he do in his spare time? He sells like arms and missile deals and like share, you know, stock market trading and all that. So for the reader, these things become okay. These things become characteristics of the hero, in fact. So this is a nice roundabout way to like okay these things. And I think my superhero is much more uh, honest. He tells you on your face like what he is about, and which is what we are seeing now also. This is a little story with the first one that became kind of popular with the thing. Uh, basically, yeah, I just go through it. Rashman, morning tea, uh -huh, news, bad. Radicals create ruckus in Russia, so he goes. Uh, they are an ugly stain on my shining city. And what's this ruckus? 
why can't you people behave? And they're like, you know, they're just asking for their land which has been taken away, or their homes and stuff like that. So he bashes them up and he catches them and he brings them to a prison, arrests these radicals, constable. And then he gives the advice, I was not paid by anybody to do this, but uh, we must be careful these days. That's why I have green tea every morning. It has antioxidants that arrest the free radicals in my body <laughs> while I take care of Rashre. <laughs> This is actually their own green tea packets, and you know these trends, right? So suddenly, green tea became like this cool thing to have. Like you know, everyone's having green tea. Like I hate it. I hate green tea, but uh, you know, nothing personal with green tea. It's just the thing on the back of the packet that was there. It said this. So I thought, like, that is a kind of a propaganda. I thought, you know, these free radicals are bad. Like nobody wants to be a free radical anymore. It's not even good for your body. Like, so oh, and free speech will not be free anymore. You'll be charged for it. Uh, you know, free. Um, which brings us to state, corporate, and, well, for us, religious, God, power, and me. Now, who's against us? This is pretty much the line we toe, I think. Uh, the small businesses, the small operators are getting sidelined. If you belong or if you work for a larger company or uh, you can contribute to that, then you have a place in society. If you're doing your own thing, good luck. Okay? So I think all of you should like go and work with large corporations and you know build unsustainable things. Um, this is that that uh, Obama poster thing, you know. Um, so then we go to Rashman also has a, a sidekick called Cowboy. He's half uh, he's calf god, half man actually. So these are his goons, and then um, yeah, this is without any visuals. So you know, thank you. Um, again, social life, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> this is an exercise we did in uh, over a week on Braindead. So we try and pick up uh, these trends that you find in news and try to like connect it at the back to see how the how the you know follow the thread thing. So we had it for every day, and the idea was like. You don't read, uh, need to read any more newspaper. We have a Monday to Sunday like sorted on Braden. So any day you can come and read the newspaper and have the satisfaction of having read some newspaper. And you know, you can just like connect it, like everything is connected. And the next day it'll be about our leader, and, oh, no, this is about the leaders, and the next one is about how oh, it's terrorists and like, you know, these kind of people who are like screwing up the environment and everything. And then uh, they say like, wow, it's our terrorists. Uh, terrorists are like, you know, tribal, so tribal should be moved out of the forest. And and, you know, we can take that forest and give it to the foreign corporation and things like that. So, all in the single page and lines like that. Easy to read, not that it doesn't take too much time, doesn't affect your short attention spans, so it's pretty cool. <coughs> uh, Ala, so... <laughs> it happened just before the end of one dimension of Ala, and it was destroyed completely. And it's true what they say. And, uh, this is uh, yeah, just a news piece because uh, other details were leaking all over the place and like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's mostly from the Gujarat the things. So, yeah. so uh, he's reading all the news and that's the problem with the uh, he's, he's the Times of India guy, so he can't possibly be reading all this disturbing news in the Times of India. Times of India is really nice and happy, wants you to spend more money. Um, this is just the anatomy of a political comic thing, how to draw. Finally, the character turns around to the artist and say, hey, I don't want to be in your subversive comic, you know, which is what I think the mainstream thing is like. This is the cover of the book. Uh, these are some sketches from uh, the thing. I developed a script for it, inspired by Tolkien and stuff. And uh, it was really cool in the beginning. I made every letter like unique. And then my publisher said it doesn't work because nobody can read it. But it was really cool, really cool. But then I had to like tone it down, and uh, it's become like this, and that's what the whole book is written in, because it's an alien language. It's uh, it's not really a human speaking, uh, so I wanted that outside thing to it. These are just artworks from the book pages. These are not the spreads, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's the two seventy six pages I was talking about. It's like that, and then uh, yeah, this is like you know, hala hala leading on. Where are those videos? <laughs> Bob, 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 Bob,
Cool, yeah. I think we'll stop with that. Thanks.